Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 8 today. Titus chapter 3 verse 8, looking through verse 11. I want to use these verses this morning to challenge you on the issue of a not-so-trivial pursuit. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factuous man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for preserving us, protecting us, watching over us through a stormy night. Lord, we give you thanks today that we are greeted by a beautiful Lord's Day. And that, Father, you have given us the opportunity to gather today, to come and fellowship in the Word today. Father, teach us. Give us a teachable spirit and a mind that is hungry for the Word. And, Father, satisfy us in your Word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. December 15th, 1979. I remember it well, don't you? It was just 43 years ago, very, 43 very short years ago. A photo editor named Chris Haney and his friend, sports editor Scott Abbott, decided to get together and play a competitive game of Scrabble. But when they got out their Scrabble board and pieces, they soon discovered there were too many pieces missing in order to play. Limits what you can do when you don't have all your pieces. So they got to talking and decided, wouldn't it be neat to invent their own game? So they set out to do that very thing that night. And they worked on this game for nearly two years before it actually became a 1980s phenomenon. What they decided to do was to test each other in what they knew about cultural events. Eventually, they would uh, concoct or devise a game in which... They had a piece that went around the board, and as they went around the board, the challenge was to answer correctly one question in each of six different categories. History, science and nature, sports and leisure, art and literature, geography and entertainment. As you collected those points, the the ultimate aim was to answer a question correctly, fill up your little pie with all the pieces, and then make a beeline to the center where you would win the game. Many of you are familiar with that. I remember when it came out just like it was yesterday. And when I say it became a phenomenon, it became a phenomenon. People wanted to play Trivial Pursuit. They wanted to see what they knew. And you know as well as I do, When it comes to knowledge, some people have it and some people only think they have it. (laughs) Right? How do you know if you have it? Well, what do you do with it? Can you answer the questions? Years later, I got to thinking, you know, what an ironic game. Trivial pursuit. You do understand the word trivial means that which is of little value or importance, that which concerns trifling or insignificant things, so that if you actually became a trivial pursuit champion, what you were really saying is, is you were a master of the insignificant, the winner of the unimportant. What an ironic idea, don't you think? It's interesting. The great evangelist D.L. Moody, in a sermon challenging Christians about fear and sharing their faith, about living the implications of the gospel, once said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. Now, I find a real danger 
for us as followers of Jesus Christ, for Christians. And, and that's this. There is a sense in which the Christian life can actually become something akin to a spiritual game of trivial pursuit. We circle the board of life, and as we're circling the board of life, we accumulate certain information about the Bible, certain knowledge about salvation, even about our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we circle that board of life, we tend to collect little tokens of achievement. And as we collect those tokens of achievement, we are doing so without any real, intentional, determined pursuit of growth in godliness. In other words, we become masters of the insignificant. It's not that the gospel is insignificant, and it's not that knowing about Christ is insignificant. It's not that memorizing Scripture is insignificant, but if that's all you do for the sake of knowledge, then you're, you're basically engaged in nothing more than a game of spiritual trivial pursuit. What you know and as you grow are designed to move you down the road from the gospel to godliness. That is, as you apply the gospel of Jesus Christ, as you live out the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you move in the direction of godliness. It's not that you ever move from the gospel. It's not that you ever get away from the gospel. You can't. But the gospel is designed to do something in your life, and that is to grow you in godliness. You are pursuing something that's not trivial at all. We've been looking at Paul's letter to Titus under that very banner. From the gospel to a godly life. From the very beginning of this letter, Paul tells us that he's writing this letter, that he is addressing this congregation, particularly the pastor, the elder, the missionary, emissary Titus, for a specific purpose. The very first verse of the book, he tells us that I am here and I am all about the faith of those chosen of God. That is, he's addressing believers. And the knowledge of the truth, which is in accordance to godliness. That is, I'm here to help you grow, to pursue something. And what you're pursuing is knowledge, but not knowledge for the sake of knowledge. You're pursuing it for the purpose of godliness. That you might actually grow in Christ. Growing in knowledge of the gospel for the purpose of of godliness. Now, those two words, let me clarify something. We need to understand the gospel. You need to be able to vocalize the gospel. Every believer needs to be able to tell someone what the gospel actually is. Let me remind you just one more time, because you cannot say it enough. You cannot repeat it enough. You cannot be reminded enough of what the gospel is. The most concise definition or presentation of the gospel is that given by Paul to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. The gospel, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. Christ died It gives you the avenue into talking about who Jesus is and why He died. He died to atone for your sins. He died to pay your sin debt. Scripture said He would. That's the significance of that little phrase, according to the Scripture. And that phrase is actually repeated, which tends to be emphatic. It gives emphasis. We as believers need to understand Jesus died for our sins. He died to pay a debt you and I could never pay. He was buried. The burial of Jesus is not insignificant. You bury dead things. You bury dead people. The burial of Jesus is a definitive evidence that He actually died. But He didn't stay dead. God raised Him from the dead. According to the Scriptures. According to the Old Testament. Messiah would actually suffer and die for His people, but be raised again. Justifying what He did and justifying you. Enabling you to be declared right as meeting the standard of God because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. 
That gospel saves you if you will recognize it, repent, and turn. Tur- that's what repentance is, is turning from your sinful ways and turning toward the truth of Jesus Christ. That be- then begins to take root and change your life. It moves you to godliness. Now, remember what godliness is. Godliness is not some super spiritual saint language. It doesn't mean you jump high and jump pews. Godliness just simply means you begin to actually obey the revelation of God. That's the way J.I. Packer uh, defined godliness. I gave it to you last week. Godliness is responding to God's revelation. It's responding to God's word in trust and obedience. Godliness is simply hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, and obeying the gospel. Now, when I say obey the gospel, I don't just simply mean repentance, confession, and turning to Christ. I mean actually living the gospel out in your life. That's what godliness is. It includes uh, responding to the word of God in faith and worship. It includes responding in prayer and praise. It includes submission and service. All of that is the byproduct and the fruit of the gospel. It's what godliness is. Godliness is life seen and lived in the light of God's Word. As Christians, that's why we want to study the Word. That's why we want to be exposed to the Word. Because as we are exposed to the Word, it helps us to understand how to live life in light of who Jesus is. The Gospel has practical implication in the lives of believers. Listen, if the Gospel doesn't move you to grow in godliness, if your pursuit of the knowledge of the truth does not issue in growth and obedience, if it doesn't issue in greater trust, if it doesn't issue in the desire to worship, if it does not drive you to submission and service, then you may just be playing trivial pursuit. You may become the master of the insignificant and the king of that which does not matter. Here in Titus, Paul is helping Titus and us to understand that the gospel is not trivial. That the gospel matters. And living the gospel matters just as well. Verse 8, as Paul picks up, remember he has just given us this incredible statement of the gospel. Verses 4 through 7. Centered in the statement, he died for us. As he has that hanging in the air, he continues in verse 8, This statement is trustworthy. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Concerning whatever is trustworthy, I want you to insist on, speak confidently about. So that those who have believed will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for people. Then drop down to verse 14. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds. Now, as we have seen throughout this letter, Paul is concerned equally about two things in the lives of these believers in Crete. By application, that means he's concerned about two things for you and I as well. As professing Christians, number one, he's concerned about our spiritual health. He was very concerned about the spiritual health of the Cretan Christians. We see that expressed in his continued repetition and encouragement to Titus to engage in sound doctrine. To teach sound doctrine. We live in a day in which the idea of sound doctrine is almost a foreign language. It's seen as impractical. What difference does it make? If I know doctrine, I have found doctrine to be quite divisive, so why don't I just love Jesus? Okay, which Jesus are you going to love? Tell me about Jesus. And when you begin to tell me about Jesus, guess what you are going to begin to tell me? Doctrine, sound or otherwise. There is no option for believers as far as doctrine and theology. Everybody, R.C. Sproul used to say, everybody's a theologian, to which we should reply, either a good one or a bad one. You are a theologian. The question is, are you a good one or are you a bad one? Are you a sound one or are you a bogus one? Well, Paul's concerned that we be sound. 
The second thing he's concerned about is our public witness in light of it. Which is why we have the emphasis on godliness. Does what you believe have an impact in how you live? That's why Paul left Titus there. Titus is on Crete to complete what was needed in this church. He's there to establish leadership. Shepherds, pastors, overseers, elders. The language is all synonymous. We're talking about the same men. Men who are gifted in the Word, who could teach the Word in order to move these believers on to God godliness. And he exhorts Titus continually in this very brief letter. Chapter 2, verse 1, Titus, teach what is in accordance with sound Scripture. Explain, communicate the behavior that goes with it. At the end of chapter 2, he exhorts him again. Titus, declare these things. Exhort the people with these things. Reprove with authority. Do not let them dismiss you. These things that Paul mentions in Titus chapter 2 is the Christian character that is the byproduct, the fruit of the root of the gospel. Titus and those who are appointed to lead the church Teaching elders were to shepherd the sheep. I like the way Alistair Begg puts this. He uses this metaphor of the sheep and says they were to shepherd the sheep by means of the crook of God's Word. The sheep are led into pasture by bringing them to the Bible to understand the Scriptures. How do you grow in godliness? You grow in godliness through growth in the Word. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. The crook of Scripture. He's referring to the shepherd's crook. Many of you have heard me say this before. The ancient Palestinian shepherd had two tools that he used to take care of his sheep. He had the staff and the crook. The staff included a studded club at the end of it, just in case. You know, that, that studded club could be used either on the enemies of the sheep or, you know, sometimes you have to pop your own sheep with a studded club. But the crook he would use to grab a sheep by the neck to pull him out of danger. Guess what pulls you out of danger if you'll pay attention? Scripture. Temptation comes into your life. Uh, you're tempted to go in the wrong direction. Thank God when he brings somebody across your path that can be the crook of the word to kind of pull you back. So that's what we are seeing here in the book of Titus. And understanding Scripture, pursuing the Word of God, has a definitive purpose. There's a reason why we gather here to hear God's Word explained to us. We don't do it merely to accumulate information so that we can answer questions and complete our trivial pursuit pie. We do it so that our life can be transformed, to know Christ better. Because in knowing Christ better, we live for Christ more completely. It's not about just knowing Scripture. It's knowing Scripture to know Christ. It's knowing Scripture to know the ways of God, the character of God. It's knowing Scripture to grow in grace. We are pursuing growth in godliness and good works, good deeds. That's the emphasis we're going to see here in these verses. So there are two exhortations I want you to see uh, that Paul is giving to Titus. We're going to spend the lion's share of our time on the first one. And I'm really going to just miss, miss, mention the second one toward the end uh, with the idea of coming back and expanding it more fully next week as I wrap up Titus next week. Yeah, we're going to be done with Titus next week. And we want to tie it all together. But two exhortations for today to make sure that we're not guilty of playing spiritual trivial pursuit. Exhortation number one is this. Titus, exhort the brothers to pursue the profitable. Exhort the brothers, exhort believers to pursue that which matters. Not to pursue the trivial, but to pursue the profitable. We see it in verse 8. This statement is trustworthy, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. That's New American Standard. Speak confidently confidently be insistent on these things so that those who believe God that is believers who have believed this will be careful to engage in good deeds these things are good and beneficial for people now 
Notice the beginning of that verse. This statement is trustworthy. This statement. Well, what statement is Paul talking about? Because what follows is going to be contingent upon understanding what is it that makes this such an important principle. This statement. What statement? Well, Paul is very careful here to help us understand a critical fact. In fact, he does this quite frequently. He wants us to understand that we're not saved by works, but works are important in the equation of salvation. We need to understand that because, listen, people very quickly confuse good works and salvation. It, listen, it is our, it's inherent within our nature that we want to do something to earn favor. We want to do something. We don't want somebody just giving it to us. We want to be able to say, look what I did. Look what I did. And listen, when it comes to a right standing before God, when it comes to salvation, there's nothing truer than we want to believe we had a hand in it. This is what I did. And if you're not careful, you will cross the line from orthodoxy to heresy very quickly. So you need to understand, we need to understand the role of of good works and salvation. Because, let's be honest, Baptists are notorious for believing good works have nothing to do with it at all, so that what we do is profess salvation, live the way we want to, and say we're all right because we were saved once, so we're good no matter what we do. By the way, there is a statement for that to describe what that is. It's called false teaching. Because nowhere in Scripture can you walk away with the idea that you can be saved and lived however you please. It simply is not there. What you find is that good works are a part of salvation. They just don't earn you salvation. Works are not the cause of salvation, but they are the natural fruit of salvation. They are the result of salvation. They are evidence that salvation has actually happened. Paul emphasizes this here in verse 8 of Titus with what we call a quotation commendation form. Quotation commendation. In other words, he is going to link the root of salvation with the fruit of salvation with a little three-word Greek phrase. The word pistos halogos. It is a trustworthy statement. The word pistos or pisteo, to believe, or the noun form would be faith. Adjectivally, it's faithful. Halogos is the word. Faithful is the word. It is a trustworthy statement. It is something that you can take to the bank. You can hang your hat on it. We've got our little statements that communicate that same thing. Oh, if I tell you, you can hang your hat on it. You can take it to the bank. This is as true as true gets. That is a statement unique to Paul. In fact, in the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, He will use that phrase five times. Five times to convey the trustworthiness, the truthfulness of what he has said. And I'll be honest with you, this is something that is worth our our time to look at. So let's digress for just a moment. And let me show you these five statements real quick because they're in the pastoral letters and they all tie together to help us understand the significance of the gospel practically in the life of believers. Listen, just grasping these five statements will keep you from playing trivial pursuit with the gospel. Statement number one, he gives us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. For me, this is the most insightful, relevant of all the statements. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement, and it deserves full acceptance... That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of which I am the worst you've ever seen. And that's Paul talking. It is trustworthy. You can hang your hat on this. You can take this to the bank. There's nothing truer than this. Christ came to save sinners. And when it comes to sinners, you're looking at the chief of them. I'm the worst. Now, you may be thinking, whew, man. Paul didn't think much of himself. Oh, on the contrary. Paul thought a lot of himself, particularly before he came to know Christ. But when he came to know Christ, when Jesus ran him down on the Damascus Road and opened his spiritual eyes, and for the first time he saw what he really was, he realized what he really was. 
And when he saw what he was, he, he, he was just absolutely devastated at how sinful he really was. By the way, if that can be said of the Apostle Paul, it can be said of Pastor Todd. It can be said of every one of us in here. There is no greater truth in this world than the fact that Jesus came to save sinners and you and I are the worst possible cases. Now, if that offends you, good. It should offend you. You know why? It's offensive. The gospel is by nature offensive because it requires us to actually see what we really are. And it requires us to go outside of ourselves for help. I got news for you. Your answers are not in here. They're up there. They're in Christ. That's your answer. That's the hope. So when Oprah tells you, you just need to go inside, here's what you need to do to Oprah. Click. Don't get your spiritual counsel from a diet in the wool pagan. Get it from the source of truth. That's the first trustworthy statement. The second one, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If a man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. I haven't spent any time at all on this verse, so let me just mention very quickly. In the same category of you can take it to the bank that Jesus came to save you and you need it, is this particular statement about the men God calls to lead you. It is a trustworthy statement. You can take it to the bank that anybody who sets, any man who sets his heart on or who aspires to the office of overseer is aspiring to something that is in and of itself worth it. It's not easy. It's difficult. But it's worth it because of what's at stake. That's why it matters who's there. That's why there are qualifications for it. Because there's nothing more important in this world than having someone who can give themselves to the Word to help believers understand the Word because it's the Word that grows us in godliness. It's the Word that grows us in Christ's likeness. It's the Word that helps us to live in light of the Gospel. And we need help with it. Oh no, Scripture says, I have an anointing, I don't need any help. You need to understand what that means. I don't have time to get into that right now, but just trust me. Listen to me, everybody. This may be the most important thing I say today. You need help. I need help. We need someone to come along beside us to help us understand the truth that not only sets us free, but grows us. Our biggest problem today is in this radically independent, self-autonomous culture, we think we don't need anybody. And the reality is there's not a person in this world who doesn't need somebody to come along and help them on this spiritual journey. That's why salvation and the body of Christ is just that. It's in the context of the body of Christ. Each a different member, but needing one another to be fully healthy and functional. That's why you need to be here. To grow in the gospel. Otherwise, your pursuit is going to be nothing but a game of spiritual, trivial pursuit. Statement number three. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8b and 9. Godliness is beneficial for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. You can hang your hat on it. You can take it to the bank. Godliness is good for you. It's beneficial to you. It is important in this present life and even more so in the life that is to come. Am I to understand that Paul is suggesting that a lot of life in eternity is going to be contingent on life in the present? Is life in the present kind of the warm up for the real uh, life that's coming? I believe it is. I believe what we do in this life matters. I believe it carries on to our eternal state. No, it's not going to contribute to your salvation, but you might be surprised to find out how eternity does have a connection to the present life. That's why it matters how you live as a believer. That's why godliness is essential. That's why the gospel 
leads us to godliness. Statement number four. For this reason, I endure all things. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. For believers, in other words, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. This statement is trustworthy. If, he died, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Boy, that's a sermon all to itself. But notice, it is a trustworthy statement. Paul says, let me tell you why I go through what I go through for the sake of the believers. Any pastor who's done this for any time at all understands you pay a price for being in this position. You take a beating for being in this position. The beating is in the form that many of you can never see. The, the spiritual chaos and warfare that you have to go through. But Paul says it's worth it. And here's why. Because you are helping believers to actually obtain the salvation they profess to Hold on to. It is a trustworthy statement. If you die with Him, you'll live with Him. If you will not die to self, guess what? Then He did not die for you. If you won't die to you, why should He die for you? Oh, no, no. I can do whatever I want. Wrong. Listen, we have sadly been preaching almost an antinomian form of the gospel. Where we are basically teaching people, just believe and live however you want. Guys, that does not work. That is not a trustworthy statement. But I tell you what is. If you will die with him, he will die for you. If you will endure, you will reign with him one day. If we deny him, he'll deny us. How many times do you remember Jesus saying, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father? He said it more than once, didn't he? Uh, here's the question. Do you find yourself perhaps sometimes guilty of denying him with your life? The fifth statement. Titus 3.8. Weren't those four magnificently insightful texts to help you understand what the gospel is and what it implies in the life of a believer? Well, look at this last one, verse 8 of Titus. This is where we are. The fifth use of it is right here. This statement is trustworthy. What's he talking about? He's talking about what he just said, which is verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. Do you remember what I said last week about that passage? That's one Greek sentence. That's the, that one, it's one statement, but we've got it broken down into four verses. Centered around, he died. Let me remind you what I said last week, and this will be the way of kind of explaining this. This is trustworthy. You can hang your hat on this. There's no truer truth than this truth. He saved us by His kindness. He saved us by His love for us. He saved us by His mercy. He saved us by giving us new life, regeneration. He saved us by His Spirit. He saved us by His Son. And He saved us by His grace. We are justified by His grace to become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This trustworthy statement is the essence of the gospel. You can bet your life on the fact that he died for you and how he died for you and why he died for you. There's nothing truer than that. And because this is such a trustworthy truth, there is a consequence. There is an expectation. I would even say there is an obligation for the one who believes this. And that obligation is simply this. Pursue godliness. Live in light of the gospel. Live in light of the fact that he died for you. Live your salvation. That's the implication. Titus, pastors, elders, listen. I want you to speak confidently. That's the NAS translation. NIV, I want you to stress these things. The ESV, I want you to insist on these things. Why? Why is Paul insisting that we teach this? Why is he saying stress this? Stress the gospel? Quite simple because the gospel changes people's lives. So that those who believed God, who have believed, will be careful to engage in good deeds. These are good and beneficial for everyone. How important? Paul says take care in providing this instruction. 
Paul says, listen, teach with conviction, Titus. Teach with compassion. Teach with confidence. Stress this. Insist on this. So that those who have believed will be exhorted, encouraged, moved to good works. Growing in godliness, growing in obedience, growing in faith, growing in worship, growing in fellowship together is proof that you've tasted eternal life. It's proof. It gives the evidence. I can't tell you how many people I've known through the years. I've, I lost count a long time ago who have asked me the question, Pastor, how, how, can I, how can I be sure? How can I know I'm saved? Well, how can you know? You say, well, I can't know. Well, yeah, you can know. How can you know? How about the evidence that I've just talked about? What does your life look like? Do you neglect coming to church? Do you never read the Bible? Is prayer a chore for you? All these things that Paul says are the evidence. Do you see that evidence in your life? What it comes down to for too many people is, well, you know what? I had a pastor one time who told me to write the date that I was baptized, and that's my proof that I'm saved. No, that's the proof that you got wet. The proof that you're saved is the evidence of growth and godliness. That's the proof. That's our proof. God, through the person and work of His Son, saved us. Listen, He saved us from sin and death. He saved us from the devil and an eternity in hell. He, he saved us from the wrath and judgment of God. That's compelling, encouraging proof. And you know what? It should be powerful motivation for us to live in light of the gospel. Andreas Kostenberger said a true appreciation of the gifts of God will engender willing, even eager ministry on behalf of others. What he's saying is if you've really tasted that God is good and you have come to understand and appreciate the gifts of salvation, you will willingly, eagerly give your life in service to others. Listen, you can't say it enough. You can't teach it enough. You can't repeat it enough. This is unimpeachable, un unassailable truth. You can count on this. Tell them, Titus. Ground them in the truth. Tell them that he saved us. Tell them how he saved us. Tell them why he saved us. And exhort them, teach them to pursue, to engage in good works because he did save you. Again, good works don't save you. But brothers, sisters, listen to me. A life that has been saved will prove itself by how it lives in light of its salvation. These things are good and beneficial for all people. So, you've been accepted by God. You know, we, we talk about, have you accepted Christ? Now, I tell you a more, it's much more important question. Has He accepted you? Has He accepted you? Well, He's accepted you in His redemptive plan. And He has gifted you the gift of eternal life. And He has brought you into His body. You've been graced. You've been mercied. You've been set free. Now what? Well, the now what is live who you are in Christ. That is the now what. Pursue that which profits not just for now, but for all of eternity. Well, pastor, how do I do that? How, how do we do that? How, how do I grow in godliness? How do I pursue the profitable? How do I keep my life from becoming a game of spiritual trivial pursuit? Well, here's how it works. How do you pursue good works? You pursue good works by pursuing godliness because they go together. Okay, now that doesn't really help me. You're telling me to pursue good works and you're telling me to pursue godliness. They go together. How do I do that? I'm glad you asked. Pursuing good works, pursuing godliness necessarily comes from pursuing the word, from growing in the word. Again, go back to Titus 1.1. Paul said, I am Paul. I am a slave to God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am that for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. I'm here to help you pursue godliness. You pursue it by pursuing the truth of God's word. God's way of sanctifying, as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, is through the medium of truth. It's through his word. So that it is the truth of God working in us that produces sanctification. How do you grow as a believer? How do you grow in godliness and how do you grow in good works? You do it by pursuing the Word. That's why the Word of God is so important. That's why 
Knowing the Word is critical in the life of a believer. Listen, don't confuse doing good things as humanity, as a human, with actually living the gospel for the spiritual benefit of others. Those are not the same thing. Yes, you ought to be nice and kind to people. You ought to help a little old lady cross the street. Those things are a given, right? But what about serving the body? Sometimes a body that doesn't want to be served. How do you do that? Well, you grow in Christ's likeness and you grow in Christ's likeness by growing in the Word. Listen, we don't study Scripture for the sake of knowing Scripture alone. We study Scripture for the sake of knowing Christ and serving Him. Another way we can put this, and by the way, I believe I know why this is ordained this way. It's because in the way God has designed us, what we do grows out of how we think. So guess what your thinker needs more than anything? Guess what your thinker needs more than anything? Let me give you a hint. Romans 12, 2. You need your thinker renewed, regenerated, transformed. I beg you, beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, that which is holy and acceptable to God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You, you notice what he's saying there? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why is your mind being renewed? Because you don't want to be like everybody else. You don't want to be like the world. You don't want to think like the world. Well, if you don't want to be like the world, don't think like the world. How do I keep thinking from thinking like the world? Think after Christ. Have your mind transformed. Renew your mind. How does that come? The Word. That's how it works. You want to know why a lot of people are not pursuing good works? It's because they're not pursuing Scripture. And because they're not pursuing Scripture, their mind is not being renewed and transformed. And they fall into the pattern of thinking like everybody else. When the church thinks like the world, it looks like the world, and it has nothing to offer the world. That's why it's important for those Cretan Christians to pursue godliness. But guess what? That's why it's important for those Munford Christians to pursue godliness as well. Pursuing godliness in community. Listen, there is nothing... That will make you or will challenge your godliness like trying to grow together with brothers and sisters in Christ with whom you sometimes don't always see eye to eye. Right? And don't even get me talking about submissing, us being submissive to these guys that want to teach us that, you know what, I have issues with them. I, you know, they have problems. I, listen, I'm the first one to confess. I have issues. Would you like for me one day to come in and talk about my issues? Would you like to hear about my issues? No, you wouldn't, would you? Some of you would. You know why? You want something to gossip about. Some of you, it's probably been a long time since you had roast pastor for lunch. Sound doctrine. The Word of God changes the way we think. It renews our mind. And new thinking, a renewed mind will produce a new life if you will actually act on a renewed mind. And therein lies our challenge. If I simply pursue the Word, if I'm just pursuing biblical knowledge, uh, then, you know, growth in godliness is going to be minimal. If all I'm doing is pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake, if you don't apply what you learn, it's just going to be trivial pursuit. If you don't do something with what you are exposed to in Scripture, then you're not going to make a lot of headway or a lot of progress. So you've got to apply the truth. You've got to learn the word, obey it, worship in light of it, pray and praise in light of what you're learning in the assembly of the saints, not neglecting worshiping together, living day to day in light of all these things. And you have to take care to do it. The fact that Paul adds that statement, notice in verse 8, so that those who have believed will be careful to engage. Do you know why he adds that? Because... This does not come naturally to us. In fact, have you ever sat there and you heard something? I mean, God hits you right between the eyes with something the pastor said. And you kind of 
repel it or kind of resist that. You, you, but that hit close to home. Well, guess what? You're going to have to fight to do the truth sometimes because your natural sinful self doesn't want to do that. So you're going to have to be careful to do this. You're going to have to engage. You're going to have to be delivered about this. Is it difficult? Yes, indeed, it is difficult. That's why verse 14 of Titus 3, notice Paul adds this. Our people must learn to engage. You know, sometimes we move toward doing what is right and living the gospel with somebody grabbing our arm and twisting it behind our back. Well, that's no way to do it, is it? No, it shouldn't be that way. But sometimes it has to be that way. By the way, I do not like twisting anybody's arm. I almost refuse to twist anybody's arm. Uh, maybe we need to get God to twist your arm. You know, he, he has a, a really interesting way of getting our attention. And it tends to come in the most unexpected of ways. But listen, trust me. If you're a true, if you're a brother, if you're a sister in Christ... You're going to have to work to live the gospel because you don't want to too many times. We're in a day right now to where, listen, being faithful to the word is, is going to be a job. But it'll be the best job you ever had. Difficult, absolutely. But it's worth it. It's worth it now. It's worth it for eternity. I am becoming acutely aware of... Uh, the concept of expiration dates on products. Because I've told you before, you have an expiration date on your product as well. And you're getting closer and closer to your expiration date. And the closer you get to it, well, let's just say we become more acutely aware of it, don't we? Our time is running out. Pretty soon, our, our time is over with. I'm thinking about that too much lately. I, I'm realizing I'm winding down. I'm coming to the end of the road. I know some of you say, oh, come on, you're not that old. I'm old enough to know that I'm coming to the end of the road. I'm a lot closer to home than I was yesterday. You are too. Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to hear? Do you long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Or are you concerned about what you might hear? Engage in pursuing that which is profitable. Exhort the brothers to pursue that which matters. The second thing, I'm not even going to address this. We'll save this for next week. The other word of exhortation is warn the brothers to avoid that which is unprofitable. I got a feeling that'll take a while anyway because we've got to talk about some of the things we waste our time on. Some of the arguments that we waste our time on as Christians. We learn something, we get all wound up in it and we make it the issue. And it's not the issue. Can you be corrected? Can you grow through it? Can you get perspective? Paul is going to say there are some issues that cause us problems that we ought to avoid, and there are some people that cause us problems that we ought to avoid. But before we avoid them, we need to warn them. Warn them once, warn them twice, and then leave them alone. Have nothing to do with them. That sounds like something we can do next week, doesn't it? Absolutely. Lunch is almost ready. Brothers, let me remind you. Don't spend your life as a Christian Succeeding in that which really doesn't matter that much. Pursue that which ultimately matters. The glory of God. As you love one another and serve Him. Father, we thank You. We praise You. That Lord, You not only save us, but Lord, You set us on a path to grow. Lord, it's a difficult path. It's not a straight shot. It's not broad and wide. It's straight and narrow. It's uphill. It's downhill. It has valleys. It has potholes. It's a difficult path. We have to labor to engage in that path. But Lord, it's a path worth walking. It is good and beneficial. It is profitable 
for not only us, but for those around us who witness our life. It's profitable for the day in which we live, and Father, just as important, it profits us for all of eternity. Because the witness of a believer has an impact on the world. That's Paul's concern with these believers in Crete. It's the concern for us today as well. Is our life a reflection of the gospel? Is it a pursuit that is profitable, or are we just playing trivial pursuit? Are we going to one day be crowned champion of that which didn't matter? Or are we going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Father, the gospel compels us to obedience. Help us to believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.